Okay, I think it's time for us to get started. So hello again and welcome to today's webinar on host card emulation. My name is Randy Vanderhoof. I'm the Executive Director of the Smart Card Alliance and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's discussion. If we go to the next slide. This webinar is being produced by the Smart Card Alliance Mobile and NFC Council. The Smart Card Alliance is a nonprofit industry association supported by multiple business stakeholders who are engaged in the smart card and smart technologies market with a primary focus on payments and identity and access security in North America. Within the broader industry scope of the organization, our members align themselves within several industry councils which serve as a center for stakeholder engagement to work on educational materials such as white papers, webinars, conferences, and workshops to raise awareness of important business and technology trends that are driving the future uses of secure chip technology in each council's area of expertise. The Mobile and NFC Council has as its primary area of expertise NFC. And the council is supportive of all mobile NFC use cases and applications inclusive of payments, mobile identity and access control, mobile data exchanges, and peer-to-peer -peer uses of the NFC communications channel, such as the exchange of data with smart tags and smart devices that communicate over the NFC radio frequency protocol. With broad industry engagement, the Mobile NFC Council hopes to accelerate the use of NFC by becoming a bridge between the technology innovators and specifications with the practical delivery of NFC solutions that deliver business benefits to industry stakeholders. Next slide. So now let me introduce today's subject matter experts who will be providing the educational content on host card emulation, a mobile technology supported across the Android mobile operating system platform that provides a communication channel to the NFC radio that does not require permission and access to the secure element in the mobile device. We're very fortunate that these individuals and their organizations are all active members of the Smart Card Alliance Mobile and NFC Council. We will start off today with Sadiq Mohammed, Vice President at MasterCard and also the Chairman of the Mobile and NFC Council and he's going to provide us with an introduction and an HCE overview. Sadiq will be followed by Peter Helderman, who's Principal Consultant at UL, and Peter's going to discuss some of the security considerations for HCE. And he'll, he'll be followed by Sri Swaminathan from First Data Corporation, who is also our Vice Chairman for the Mobile and NFC Council, and uh, Shri will be talking about HCE use cases and some of the challenges of implementing this technology. I'll return at the end of the session for a quick wrap up and conclusions and then uh, moderate the Q&A session. While these uh, presentations are going on, you're invited to submit your questions to me um, using the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the screen on your uh, GoToMeeting website. And uh, we'll be reviewing and sorting those questions and prioritizing them during the course of today's webinar so that we can um, utilize that time best for everyone. So next slide, please. So let me turn over the session to Sadiq Mohammed to deliver an overview of HCE. Sadiq? Thanks, Randy. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Sadiq Mohammed from MasterCard. And I'm super excited to be presenting the introduction to this interesting webinar on host card emulation. Uh, so let's get right to it. Uh, Kathy, if we can move to the next slide, please. So a quick background. As Randy mentioned, the Mobile and NFC Council has been closely following the industry developments in the mobile and NFC space. And last year, as a group, we published the host card emulation HCE 101 white paper. So if you haven't seen that white paper, I highly recommend it. It is available on the Smart Card Alliance website. Um, this webinar builds upon the white paper to talk about uh, host card emulation, what it means, how does it work alongside NFC, what are some of the security and implementation considerations, and what, some of the, what are some of the use cases. So if we can move to the next slide. So before we jump into HCE, uh, let's start with NFC. So last year we did a 
webinar on NFC, the, the Mobile and NFC Council put together a presentation and I had a very successful series of webinars around NFC. So we won't go into details today, but just very quickly, uh, NFC is or near field communication is the wireless technology that enables short range communication between NFC capable devices. It has three main operating modes, uh, the tag reader writer mode, peer to peer mode, and the card emulation mode. Uh, the third, the card emulation mode is what is relevant to this webinar as the expansion of card emulation mode is what we refer to as host card emulation mode. Uh, next slide, please. So it's important to understand that NFC has been available and even commercially deployed before HCE came along. Um, so how did it work? In pre-HCE implementation, uh, the NFC traffic was always directed to an application running inside a secure element. Uh, the secure element is a secure chip, a secure processor, which runs secure applications. Um, the secure element can be in the form of an embedded secure element, uh, a micro SD, or a, a UICC or SIM based secure element. Um, so as shown in the diagram, there is an application that runs within the SD manages the communications with the NFC contactless reader. And um, there was another application uh, running on the main host processor, which managed the user interaction and user interface. Uh, so this has been, there have been very successful deployments um, using this model. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of security built in with the secure processor, secure chips to store credentials and to store uh, secure applications. Moving on to the next slide, please. So with the introduction of HCE, what has changed is there can be a single application on the main um, mobile device running on the mobile host processor um, that can manage not just the user interface and the consumer experience, but also the NFC communication with the external contactless reader. So that's the key aspect of HCE is that now the NFC traffic can be directed to an application that's running outside of a secure element and it's running on the main CPU or the main host processor on the mobile device. So um, it was first available in BlackBerry devices, but then the big push came when Google made it available on the Android platform. And since then we've seen uh, Microsoft also make an announcement that it would be available in the Windows 10 platform. It is important to note that though Apple supports NFC, it does not support HCE. So in the case of Apple devices, the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, all NFC traffic is directed to the secure element. Moving on to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, this is a huge step and there are several implications. Um, on the positive side, there is uh, reduced complexity because now NFC is available to a larger set of applications. It's not just those secure applications running within the secure element, but mainstream applications that you download from your app store and you run it on the main mobile device. Uh, those applications now have the ability to utilize NFC, uh, communicate with external contactless readers. Uh, so I think the opportunity is that it opens it up to a larger a set of applications as well as a larger group of application developers. Um, another key, uh, I think, potential benefit is that it simplifies the data provisioning um, to, to the device. So just like um, in the case of a secure element, you would have a trusted service manager which would manage pushing the application down to the secure chip and also provisioning credentials down to the secure element. Um, in the case of HCE, your application download could be as simple as you know, dropping it onto the App Store and the user just simply pulling it from the App Store. However, there's still um, some security aspects when it comes to pushing provisioning, uh, pushing provisioning credential data down to the device. And um, three has a, further down in the presentation, three has a slide which will kind of walk you through the provisioning process. But I think it does simplify um, the overall pushing, getting the app available and making credentials available to the consumer. But I think the biggest game changer is 
the dependency on us on the secure element owner. So uh, in previous implementations, if anyone wanted um, to utilize NFC, they had to have an application running inside the secure element or the secure chip, and uh, there were business implications on how to get access uh, to those uh, secure elements. So host card emulation removes that business constraint, and an application which is free to run on the mobile device can now utilize um, NFC uh, capabilities. Um, but there are also some limitations or limiting factors. The obvious one is that without the hardware-based security or the hardware secure chip, you know, there's concern, security concerns around where to store, you know, sensitive data. Um, so there are a number of uh, different models that we will see in, in, the, in the next few slides, um, but there are workarounds to kind of get around it. Um, the other limitation is also availability uh, of HCE support within the OS. So today it's available in the Android, but it has to be a certain version. So Android 4.4 and above uh, has the support for HCE. If you're running, say, Android 4.2 or 4.3, um, you know, those versions of the OS do not support HCE. Um, and the other final thing on the limitation side is that as we kind of um, remove um, the dependencies on the device, make it simplify things on the device. We also increase the complexity on the back end because now there are cloud components that are managing the application more securely. Uh, and uh, that, that's a, one of the limitations is you have a more complex back end system. So if we move to the next slide, please. So from a standards development standpoint, it's important to know that there's been a lot of activity. Um, first, I mean, Google introduced uh, HCE capabilities with the Android 4.4 back in November of 2013. Uh, since then, you know, EMV Co published their, you know, tokenization framework. And then following that, the major payment networks, Visa, MasterCard, and Amex have kind of implemented their versions of uh, HCE application support utilizing tokenization uh, framework as well. So the combination of uh, you know, HCE availability as well as a tokenization framework has enabled the networks to come up with their um, specifications in order to support uh, payment transactions or payment use case uh, utilizing HCE. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. So this is an interesting slide I mentioned earlier is that the moment uh, HCE was available, um, there were different uh, groups experimenting with different models. So how do we kind of construct and design the application? Uh, if you look at model one, um, you know, you have everything in the cloud, the application, the user data. Um, so there's nothing on the device. So this group believes that the device is a non-secure environment. You shouldn't have anything on the device. Let's keep everything in the back end, in the cloud, and control it. Uh, well, the obvious uh, downside to this is that you need to have internet, internet connectivity or network connectivity in order to utilize any of the functionality. Um, on the other opposite side of the spectrum, you have a group which thinks that, you know, the device is secure, let's just put everything on the device. So now the device has both the application as well as the user data. You don't need connectivity to the cloud and you can, you know, run transactions or conduct uh, NFC capabilities. Um, the downside to this is that there are huge security concerns on keeping everything on the device uh, without, like, hardware-based security. Um, so I think moving to model three, where I think we started to see some progress, a balanced approach where the application is on the device and the user data is, is in the cloud. So um, the application runs locally on the device, so there's no performance hit, there's no network issues. Um, but the user data is still uh, a sensitive um, security issue, and we uh, keep that in the cloud. Again, the downside here is you still need to have network connectivity in order to utilize those uh, credentials uh, as part of the utilizing the application. Uh, but I think the real breakthrough comes with Model 4, and we've seen this kind of uh, being commercially deployed uh, in the payment space where you do have uh, the application locally on the device. You do keep your user credentials safe in the cloud, 
but at the same time you kind of derive some tokenized credentials of tokens that are limited use. So you could say here's four or five limited use uh, tokens that you can push to your device and that will allow the consumer to conduct four or five transactions without the need for internet connectivity. So I think this is a quite a promising model, especially in the payment space, and most of the networks have kind of gotten behind um, this model. Uh, I think there's still experimenting going on. There's, there's solutions where maybe those tokenized credentials still need to be stored within a secure environment, within a secure chip. There's an SD model. But we are also seeing the availability of, of trusted execution environments. So I think uh, Model 4 could be further uh, strengthened by using uh, you know, trusted execution environments and TE-based security in order to uh, you know, make sure those tokenized credentials are secure within the device. So moving on to um, the next slide, please. So I just wanted to use uh, a concrete example uh, of a real-life commercially deployed application. And uh, this one is uh, an app, the mobile banking application from the Commonwealth Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And uh, it's a mobile banking app, so it's, as you can see in the first screen, you can you know, transfer funds, view your account balance, um, you know, look at you know, your cards, what your payment instruments. But the, the adi real addition is the tap and pay capability, which uh, implements HCE. And this is an example of model four that we discussed in the previous slide, which uh, allows you to create some tokens push it down to the mobile banking application. So if you have a credit or debit card uh, from Commonwealth Bank of Australia, you may have a tokenized card available to do to tap and pay transactions. So uh, it, it's a very integrated experience where you can log into your mobile banking app, uh, look at your accounts, you know, do your mobile banking of functions. But at the same time, you could utilize your payment credentials that you have with the bank to do point of sale transaction using NFC and HC technology. So this is a quite a high profile launch that has happened down in Australia. Uh, there's been abundant uh, reviews, some really good reviews coming out and, um, and some good consumer adoption numbers as well. So we are excited about the opportunities with HCE and how it kind of uh, expands the use for NFC. So um, with that, uh, moving on to the next slide, I'd like to pass it on to Peter, who would talk about the security considerations uh, for HCE solutions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Sadiq, and uh, good afternoon uh, to the audience. My name is uh, Peter Hardeman. I'm principal consultant at uh, ULTS, Transaction Security, and I will guide you through a few slides about security uh, considerations. So as Sadiq has explained uh, HCE in, in its general concepts, and notably one of its advantages is that it would allow an issuer of the application to, to not depend anymore on, an, uh, on a hardware secure element. Now, as you know, the industry invested considerable time, money, and effort in, uh, in the hardware secure element, not only the secure element itself, and think of the associated um, you know, Vico level one and level two certification, but also in the infrastructures to provision the apps securely to that secure element. Think of an MNO TSM or SP TSM. So how can it be true that all of this would suddenly not be needed anymore by somebody using this insecure environment of an Android handset? Now this is a perfectly logical and, and justified question. I mean. Is it not very easy to tamper with an Android application? No, it's, it's nice to have some ease of deployment in terms of not relying anymore on the issuer of a hardware secure element, like a, a, a SIM of an MNO. But are we not trading in security for that? So there's logically and even fully justified the perception that HCE as such is not secure, because indeed it isn't. But what we will see in the following slides is that measures can be taken in such a way uh, that actually we don't have to rely on the security that HCE as such can offer, or lack, lack thereof, rather. So by not relying on hardware-based security, but on software-based security techniques, we could bring the security to a level that may be sufficient for its purpose and bring the risks uh, to an acceptable level, which is generally what we are aiming for, right, when we implement security. 
So can we go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah, so implementing security corresponds to mitigating the risks of an attack. As you all know, <coughs> risks can generally be described as a combination of two elements. On the one hand, the impact of attacks, and on the other hand, the probability that such an attack can actually happen. So the risk would then be evaluated as a product of those two. Now, if you look at the little graph on the left, you see the impact of an attack on the vertical axis and the probability of uh, the attack on the horizontal axis. Now, needless to say, if we are in the right upper corner, we have a high security risk. So the red crosses basically correspond to the perceived risks that I mentioned on the previous slide. Now, the, the, this graph by itself is nothing new and generally used for describing risks. And But let's guess what we can apply this indeed to uh, managing the security risks of HCE-based solutions as well. We will see that we can work along both axes with different techniques, uh, which either reduce the probability or the attack, uh, sorry, the, uh, the impact of an attack. Now on the right-hand side, uh, right side, you see the four uh, different techniques that we'll be looking at. Um, so probability of a risk can be reduced uh, through software hardening or software-based security, but also authorization controls that we'll be looking at and fingerprinting of the human and also of the device. And the impact can then uh, be reduced to uh, asset devaluation or a more general, uh, more uh, usual term in the payment context is tokenization. <clears throat> so number four, um, yeah, the asset devaluation is is indeed uh, more referred to by tokenization. Okay, um, next slide, please. Yes. So let's start with the first group of techniques. So software hardening or software-based security. Now there are various techniques available these days to protect uh, software based on, on software. Some techniques actually exist since a very long time, but they now have a renewed interest because of its application in this new context. So in the, in the more distant past, attacking software often corresponded to reverse engineer spaghetti code and uh, with a lot of patience and hard work, you would finally get there. But today it is more about solving very complex mathematical problems. We listed a few numbers, uh, a few techniques on the right side, and I will attempt to describe the essence of each in only a few phrases, which will be challenging, but I'll give it a try. So to start with code obfuscation, the main purpose there is to, to write the code in such a way that if you decompile it, it still doesn't make sense. For example, if, uh, if today you, you de decompile an Android app, you may see a variable amount, but with obfuscation, you would call that for example, C8, which is completely meaningless for someone trying to understand the code. Uh, protection code injection is mainly about uh, mechanisms to detect tampering of the code and um, manipulation of the execution flow. So if a hacker would uh, adjust or tamper with the code, then the program itself would detect it. Moving on to white box cryptography, this is about dissolving the assets, for example, the keys, into the code itself. So you essentially convert functions, with, which would be easy for a hacker to recognize and exploit, into just data. So to give a very simple example, uh, rather than including in the code the function add to numbers, you could re represent that function through data only, where you do a look lookup in a table, given the numbers that you want to add. Now secure virtualization is about letting the app itself run uh, in its own virtual machine. So if we look at the Java app running on a Java virtual machine, which itself runs on a processor, then two plus three is five. Uh, on a Java level, it would appear differently on a processor. So this would make it more difficult for an attacker to interpret what, what's going on. But the TEE, the Trusted Execution Environment, is a concept that mainly, many, many of you will be very familiar with. It provides a secure area that resides in the main processor of the smartphone. Now these are examples uh, of uh, software hardening or software-based security all limiting uh, the probability of an attack. Now let's go to the next slide where we will look at uh, the second type of techniques, which is totally different, but which will also decrease the probability of, of attacks. It's about uh, authorization controls. We all know the uh, famous phrase about <laughs> protecting security through uh, something you know, for example, a password or a PIN, uh, something you have, a physical card or a token or a mobile device. And more recently, we added to that something you are you know, biometrics. 
However, we may add a fourth one to that action, something you do. So in fact, we would leverage your behavior uh, as well to implement security. So what you see in this slide is an example of leverage, leveraging the something you do component, and then the, if you make a car present transaction in London at a certain time and you'd be uh, doing something similar in New York uh, 15 minutes later, that would be extremely suspicious. Or if the G GPS of your phone says, I'm in location X, while the payment appears to be done in location Y, that, uh, that of course could trigger some alarms. So we are talking about transaction scoring in terms of behavior. Uh, if I've never gone before to a Macy's and suddenly I make this huge amount of purchase, that could be uh, suspicious. So obviously big data plays a big role here. And uh, you know, it could also work for transit. Uh, if you check in in north of Paris and two minutes later you check out in the south of Paris and something is wrong. And similarly, in, uh, in the context of access control, uh, if you never come to the office at night, then that may, might be very suspicious if some, suddenly you do. Okay, let's move on to the next slide to uh, look at the, the, the third um, category um, of measures. You know, as we move from, from hardware to more software-based security, it is, uh, it is clear that the identification and the authentication of not only the user, but also of the device becomes uh, more important than ever. So with a pin code or, or a human fingerprint, as, as on the left side, you only authenticate the user of the device, whereas the right side of the slide is about authenticating the device itself. And here we don't only talk about identification and authentication of the device to the cloud, but also to the app that resides in the device. In other words, we may establish a kind of binding between the application and the device. So the software will generate transactions only on that specific device. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, yeah, so the authentication uh, would be used uh, not only for transactions, but also, for example, to connect to the cloud to uh, retrieve, uh, uh, you know, uh, tokens or session keys, uh, as were previously mentioned, and what, which we will come back to later on in this uh, presentation. Okay, next slide, please. Yes, now we move to uh, the fourth group of measures, which uh, reduces the risk along the X of, uh, of impact. So asset devaluation, it brings, well, let's say it, it discourages the attacker by devaluating the asset that he could potentially attack. And secondly, it limits the loss Therefore, if the attacker does the attack uh, successfully. So the approach is based on the assumption that any hacker can open uh, an HCE application and get access to its assets. The tokenization, well, which is different words for the same thing, is about making sure that, that the asset represents little value or and it can be used by a hacker only once or a few times. No, let's say only once, if at all. So, but tokenization is actually a term that is pretty hot these days and it is mentioned all the time in many different contexts and the different meanings and, and the types of tokens are sometimes confused. So, you know, it, it started all uh, uh, quite a long time ago. But the notion of tokenization is not, not that new. It was introduced years ago by NC where it was aimed at protecting uh, sensitive card data specifically within the merchant and the acquiring domain. And then it gained a lot of momentum when Ian Vico published the specs in the beginning of 2014, focusing on the uh, tokenizing the pen and generalizing the concept of tokenization in uh, terms of roles and assigning certain attributes to the tokens, like the domain or the channel that they could be used in. And the last big step was, as some of you may remember, September last year when Apple made their big amount announcement on uh, Apple Pay, where they actually explained to consumers uh, they made the consumers aware of the concept of tokenization. And they, they, they use it in their messaging to the consumers. Now note that whereas Apple uh, tokenizes a static pen in a hardware-based IQ element, uh, for HCE the assets remain uh, generally in the cloud, and then we download batches of little pieces of information needed to perform a, a transaction, like a limited use key or a session key. Yeah, and the uh, last thing I wanna mention about uh, the advantages of tokenization is also that you can apply a certain control, meaning uh, you can make uh, a token valid only for a certain channel. Uh, so you could prevent cross-channel uh, fraud, or you can link it to a merchant type. Right? So if you steal a token, 
you cannot uh, use it, uh, for example, for a card not present transaction. Okay, um, I think uh, we can go to the next and the last uh, slide, which is basically uh, a summary. Uh, a few key messages uh, that I want to give here. So it is true that HCE as such does not offer any security, but by applying these methods that we just uh, briefly discussed, you can uh, reduce the risk to, a, to, a, to a, an acceptable level by simply not relying on, uh, on HCE as such, but by applying uh, software-based uh, risks. So we have taken a look at various techniques uh, reducing those risks, where the asset devaluation or tokenization reduces the impact of an attack, and the other three groups that you see uh, listed there on the slide, they uh, generally reduce the probability of an attack. Now the last point on this slide is actually a very important one that we didn't really address yet, but the issuer of the, the app has now many degrees of freedom and, and choices, uh, implementation choices to make when implementing uh, HCE, much more than uh, you know when you compare it to the, the more classical approach, if I may call it classical, <laughs> of uh, hardware-based secure element in TSMs. This means that the security finally obtained uh, by the overall solution depends a lot on the, the, the implementation uh, that the issuer uh, realized and the choices he made. Okay, I think uh, these are the, the thoughts I want to share with you on the topic of uh, security. I will now uh, hand over to Sri, who will dive into the actual use cases and, and, and other challenges. Go ahead, uh, Sri. If you're on, we're not hearing your audio. Okay. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Um, thank you, Peter. Greetings, everyone. My name is Shrey Swaminathan. In this section, we will explore the highlights of HC use cases and its advantages and challenges. Next slide, please, Kat. HC can be used to support a wide spectrum of payment and non-payment use cases. So this enables service providers to add HCE solution to their existing mobile wallets or integrate to their partner apps as well. This can be offered as an individual use case for a single domain such as payments or combining uh, multiple use cases to synergize the benefits. For example, consumers can use their HC enabled mobile phones, tap it at the merchant's point of sale for an in-store purchase or buy something online using in-app purchase feature. They can also use it at the turnstile to get into a train, use it as a badge to access to the buildings turn it into a hotel room key, an event ticket as a prepaid card at the concession stand, and so on, all with a single tab. Next slide, please. Now, let's take a look into the payments use case. This uses the model number four we just saw in uh, Sadiq's presentation in the previous uh, section on HCE overview. Here, the consumer's bank announces HCE payment enablement. So the consumer downloads the HCE app and requests their card to be added to their wallet. The request first goes to bank's tokenization platform and gets verified with bank's processing platform for its authenticity. Once verified, the card number is tokenized and formatted data gets pushed to the cloud. And then the cloud provisions their card to users HCE mobile phone. There could be an optional activation step 
needed before the consumer can actually take their device and to make payments to make sure this is not a fraudulent request. This way, consumers can use their credit, debit, private label, prepaid, and gift cards without a need to carry them in their physical wallet. You may frequently hear the term provision. So this means adding the card to the device a HCE enabled device or a secure element based device in such a way that can be used for making an NFC in store or an in app transaction. Next slide, please. Since the support of HCE announcement by Google starting Android KitKat 4.4, there has been significant movements to the HCE initiatives in the market. There are pilots and commercialization efforts taking off around the world. Here we have listed some of the HCE pilots and commercialization announcements. Google's recent announcement of Android Pay supporting multiple payment brands is a HCE based, based implementation, the one that is listed at the bottom of the listing here. Next slide, please. So once the payment card has been provisioned to a device, user opens their mobile wallet and taps it to merchant's point of sale to make a payment. Then merchant system sends the tokenized credentials through the existing payment channel for authorization to issuer's processing platform. Behind the scenes, authorization involves detokenization credential verification and auth response. In secure element-based implementations, once the card details are provisioned, it can stay on the chip for its entire life, whereas HC adds a secret sauce that is called limited use payment keys to improve the security. This is one of the compensating controls we just saw in the presentation before. These credentials are valid only for limited number of transactions or a specific time period or a dollar amount, et cetera. So this requires a replenishment of credentials based on the usage by the consumer. Next slide, please. Another promising area for HCE is the value add services such as loyalty, coupons, and offers. In today's environment, loyalty and offers are managed by scanning a printed barcode or using mobile barcode key tags or plastic cards. Coupons and loyalty acceptance can be leveraged by NFC technology. With, with the leverage uh, uh, of uh, this particular technology and large availability of memory in the device, the storage possibilities, and also instant updates of loyalty and coupons from the provider's e-commerce platform makes it a best use case for HCE. Combining payments and loyalty and offers provides a very simple yet powerful experience to the consumers. Solution providers, e-commerce platforms can send coupons and offers to com consumers' phone based on their preference settings. Some of the pilot examples of value-add services were done earlier by Google and their SoftCard. So they were uh, called Single Tab from Google and uh, Smart Tab from SoftCard implementation. Next slide, please. So from the surveys and reports in this slide, it, it shows clearly that uh, mobile users have a high preference for rewards. At the same time, they also expect a seamless experience for redemption of rewards and coupons without scanning them manually. Also, with the recent success stories from Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts, it's obvious that consumers have a huge preference for payments combined with loyalty via their mobile apps. So this makes perfect case for NFC to enable value-add services along with payments.
explicit use cases to transit employs millions of NFC transactions today. HC offers a great flexibility to transit consumers and also employees via their mobile devices that are HC enabled. Consumers can buy their tickets without standing in lines at the ticket counters or vending machines. Their ticket credentials can be downloaded to their devices from remote locations. Transit systems have started to move towards a new system called account-based systems. This can enable payment tokens as a ticket for authentication at the turnstile. Use of HC credentials is a safe and convenient way to achieve both purposes. Transit systems also provide access to emergency workers, first responders via limited HC credentials pushed to the device by the providers. Next slide, please. HC can be an ex excellent mechanism for hospitality, access, events, and uh, theme parks. In the hospitality industry, once a consumer checks in via their mobile app, their room key credentials can be sent to their mobile device. Credentials can be valid only for the duration of their stay. And uh, this way, guests can also check out via their apps for credentials disablement. Users can buy event and theme park tickets and download their credentials to mobile apps to gain access via their HC devices. This can combine access to specific rights and events and also use as a key to guest rooms. There are abundant of opportunities uh, that can be leveraged through HC. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we um, do a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, the use cases we just discussed about. Uh, in payments, HC transactions can be EMV enabled, providing ample space to add multiple cards as there are no secure elements involved. This is one of the challenges in the secure element-based implementation. While lack of trusted service manager requirement provides control to the issuers, this can shift the complexity to issuer systems based on the implementation. One of the benefits with HC is that multiple service provider apps can coexist in the same device without a clashing of uh, each other. One of the challenges is that HC requires network connectivity for credentials replenishment based on the configuration. Second one, the value at services, they combine payment, loyalty, and uh, coupons you know, with, a, with a single tap. While the implementation is simple on the device side, especially with HCE, the point of sale terminal side is a bit challenging. It, it requires some software updates or firmware upgrades. Currently, there are independent implementations by point of sale and wallet providers. Though there aren't any industry standards available yet, this is a nascent area providing great potential to merchants and the issuers. The last one, the transit and access, makes an excellent use case for HCE as the nature of the short-term limited use credentials make it a valuable solution. In access, diversity of protocols is one of the difficulties that has to be encountered. Though the major challenge is the lack of MyFair support in the transit use case. The account-based system upgrades that, that have been happening can make tokenized credentials meet the challenge. While HC has specifications and support in payments uh, um, are available for implementation, it is still nascent in the non-payment um, use cases. We can expect new entrants into this area. With this, I would like to conclude and uh, transition over to the moderator. Thank you. Well, terrific. Thank you very much, Sri. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd just like to wrap up with uh, the, wrap up the content from today's HCE webinar with a few concluding thoughts and direct you to where you can 
find a large number of additional valuable mobile NFC resources available for free from the Smart Card Alliance. So you heard today evidence from our three speakers about how HCE is a promising development to increase NFC adoption as it opens up NFC capabilities to a wider range of applications. Sadiq touched on some of the existing standards and specifications development, and it's clear that there's a broad support for HCE from Visa and MasterCard and other networks, and a large number of Android device platform providers, and a number of application owners like banks and transit agencies. Also, security is always an important issue when payments are involved, and Peter discussed these security concerns can be overcome with the right compensating controls and risk management and a careful layering of security features to the appropriate level of risk associated with each transaction. And Sri also pointed out that the Smart Card Alliance and the Mobile and NFC Council are continuing to monitor the developments and will talk about new use cases with HCE and continue to provide educational resources on the topic. The Alliance and the NFC Forum will be holding our annual NFC Solutions Summit Conference in Phoenix, Arizona on October 7th and 8th of this year. So please add that to your calendar. Uh, below are some uh, resources that I would like to point out to you that um, are available, including a white paper we published recently on Host Card Emulation 101, giving a primer on the topic, and then uh, a link to where we hold a number of additional um, resources available for you. If you can go to the next slide. This workshop presentation um, was developed with the support of a number of project contributors in addition to the speakers that we heard presenting today. So I'd just like to recognize those who contributed either content or reviewed the content that was presented today, including Martin Braun from UL, David DeCozen from Cubic, Peter, Philip Moyer from HID, Bob DeLug from HID, Simon Laker, Consult Hyperion, Sharir Maman from Kona, Sadiq Mohammed from MasterCard, Akif Kwasi from Discover, Tony Sabetti with CPI Card Group, Brian Stein with CH2M, Sri Swaminathan from First Data, and Sanjay Varjis from Capgemini. I really thank all of those folks uh, who helped to put this webinar together for you today. So we'll now move into the Q&A session, and we've had a few great questions that have been submitted. So um, let me begin with uh, the first question here, uh, and that I'm going to direct maybe to Peter if he could answer. Um, shouldn't there be a standard by which security is guaranteed at an acceptable level rather than leaving the level of security up to the issuer and how it's being implemented using HCE? Peter, if you're there, we can't hear you. Yes, here I am, here I am. Okay, uh, thanks very much for this question. Well, well, first of all, I would not say it, it is completely up to the uh, to the issuer to decide. Uh, the brands do uh, stipulate uh, security requirements. However, what we see is that much more functionality and therefore also security measures shift towards the issuer domain, and with that also responsibilities. So, you know, looking at the hardware-based secure elements and the TSM, we have this nice and clean separation of issuance domain and the transaction space, where both the secure element and the TSM could indeed be certified uh, against certain standards. Although bear in mind that, you know, for the TSM, this uh, certification is a lot less uh, straightforward and black and white than it is for the secure element, and there are some gray zones there too. But when it comes to security evaluation against standards, let's well, if we look at the, the payment application itself, right? Since Visa and MasterCard requirements are very much centered around that, uh, we know today that the only way we can protect the assets is by using software-based security technologies, uh, and the ones I just mentioned, uh, which themselves are not not that mature yet. So there, so this implies that the testing and certification methodology cannot be fully uh, mature either. But this is quickly. Uh, uh, developing and, uh, and evolving and um, you know but again I, I want to point out that the main the most important difference with the HCE is that a number of backend systems now fall within the issuer domain and that needs to be part of the risk assessment and the security evaluation so 
the, the task of testing uh, and, the, and, the, and the variance between the different implementations will be much bigger. But it is not to say that we don't know, that we don't have any standards or, or uh, requirements from the brands in terms of, uh, of the security. It's just the execution of, of certifying it will be more complex. Thank you, Peter. Do uh, uh, Mohammed, or, uh, sorry, Sadiq or uh, or Shri, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, this is Sadiq. I just want to add one comment that um, developing standards uh, takes some time. If you look in, if you compare it with hardware-based security with secure elements. Um, you have standards like you know EAL4, um, you know common criteria, and you know Mastercard CAST evaluation process. Um, so once you have a CAST certificate, you are guaranteed a certain assurance level for that particular secure element. I think uh, it's going to take some time, uh, where once we have a broad variety of implementations, we've seen different uh, security models. Uh, we, I think the industry will move towards some kind of standardization. So if you are, I mean, there is a common concept of a points-based uh, system. Like, for example, uh, in the CAST evaluation, if you, it's a range from anywhere from 27 to 35. And if you know that you are above 27, there's a medium level of assurance. And if you get to 30, 32, there's a high. So I think uh, over a period of time, standards will be developed, and there would be some mechanism to gauge the security level of a solution. Thanks, Sadiq. Uh, maybe this next question I can direct to Shri, since you were talking about use cases. Uh, transportation is an important use case for, for NFC. Um, the question is, is there a way to verify that the token is valid on a HCE implementation of NFC that does not involve um, presenting the uh, the token through the acquirer network, which we know will be a, a very slow process. Thank you for the question. That's that's a great question. Um, so uh, the answer is uh, really uh, a hard one. Um, um, the direct answer is no, but with some novel ideas, it is possible to implement some custom cryptograms to validate because. The concept of tokenization with the HCE requires this to go to the token service provider to validate for its authenticity. To some extent, transportation systems can use the token as a domain restricted um, um, uh, tool um, that alone cannot guarantee the validity of the um, token. But adding additional controls can make it possible, but token alone um, is not a um, full solution. Going offline, uh, go going online um, would be a challenging aspect to um, the transit agencies because latency is one of the factors, the turnstiles, with a few milliseconds um, for consumers to tap and uh, get the gate open and. Uh, um, to get past the turnstile. Um, yeah, this, this requires some um, novel ideas, but it's possible. Thanks. For primary technology used today in transit, can HCE also use MyFare as a means to uh, use mobile phones in a transit application? Um, Randy, I can take that question. Um, that's a great question as well. Um, so HCE standards does not support a MyFair implementation today. Uh, MyFair uses uh, proprietary protocols. Um, so the account-based systems can enable it, but MyFair does not support uh, as such via HCE. Okay, um, a question for Peter. Uh, I think this has to do with your uh, mitigation technologies for securing um, the, the mobile device. 
Um, how do you protect from a full memory copy or device cloning um, on an HCE-based implementation? Yes, uh, thanks, Aaron, for that question. Um, well, first of all, I don't think you can protect uh, against a memory dump as such. However, the question is then, what can a hacker do with this uh, this memory dump or, or this cloned device? Um, well, let's start, uh, start on, on the most straightforward level. As we have seen, the credentials in that device are uh, the assets. They, they will be generally generally be tokenized in the case of HC. So generally, they can only be used uh, once. Uh, so that by itself gives a limited impact. But on top of that, we have also seen that, you know, I discussed quickly um, the token control uh, functionality. So you can, um, you know, uh, assign a validity to the token of only to a number of um, characteristics uh, or contexts, like a certain sales channel that it can only be used for. Um, so, you know, the, the hacker would then not be able to use it uh, for any other type of transaction. And thirdly, what I now can think of is that remember that um, we also looked at device fingerprinting. So an application uh, may only may be designed in such a way that it will only work on a particular device where it is bound with uh, the fingerprint of the device, which is really unique and generated uh, by the hardware of the device. And I'm talking about there can be hundreds, if not thousands, well, let's say hundreds of characteristics uh, that uniquely define a device, even if you have two, you know, device of the same make and, and model and brand, etc. Each device is unique. Uh, if, you, if you look at the CPU, for example, there are certain um, characteristics that, that make every CPU unique, and an application uh, can recognize that uh, those characteristics and and may, uh, yeah, be designed in such a way that it can only work with the particular device it was bound with. So uh, yes, you can clone, uh, uh, well, you can copy the memory, you can do a memory dump of the device, but uh, the, the possibilities of the hacker to then exploit that will be very limited. First of all, on the, on the, uh, in terms of uh, that, that clone device, but secondly, it is not a scalable attack, obviously, which is also a very important aspect of uh, security. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you, Peter. And and I see we're just about out of time here. Um, I have one more question and maybe a short response from each of the panelists, if you could. Since we talked specifically about how HCE is not supported on the Android, or I'm sorry, on the Apple iOS platform, and the Apple device is using an embedded secure element, can anyone weigh in on the relative security? balance between an Android-based solution and HCE and an Apple-based solution utilizing um, the embedded secure element? Hey, Randy, this is Sadiq, so I'll, I'll provide my comments. Um, so yes, both solutions, uh, be it Android Pay uh, using HCE and Apple Pay uh, using an embedded ST, both use tokenization. Uh, but I think tokenization is one part of the picture, and it's not a apples to apples comparison because what happens beyond that, in the case of Apple, um, we go through the tokenization process, which is replacing the plastic card with an alternate fan or uh, what we refer to as a device fan. And as Peter mentioned, this prevents from you know cross-channel fraud. So once you've created this token and put it inside the embedded SD of an Apple device, uh, transactions can only uh, gen be generated from that device at the point of sale. So you can't you know, skim the uh, device pad, put it onto a card, go to an ATM and try to withdraw cash. That will not work because uh, there are domain restrictions and that token is supposed to generate transactions only from the device. Um, but 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 it's also available uh, for any number of transactions. So what Apple does is it puts it in a secure fashion down to the embedded SD. From there, you could keep doing transactions all day long. You don't have to go back to Apple to do any kind of verification. The 
credentials or the tokenized credentials are on the device and you can keep doing transactions. Any um, controls are, are now on the uh, transaction authorizing side. So if there is you know, suspicion of fraud, the issuer can still kind of decline the transaction, but you don't have to go back to Apple uh, to do anything. In the case of the Android model, uh, once the tokenization happens, the credentials aren't pushed uh, completely down to the Android device. They are retained in a secure cloud server. Uh, and only a limited set of use keys or limited session keys or single use keys uh, are pushed down to the device. So if, if the issuer decides that their risk tolerance is five transactions, then Google will, using those tokenized credentials, create five um, you know, tokenized credentials and push it down to the device. From that point, the user can now do five transactions, but once they've done those five transactions, they need to go back to the Google service to get additional tokens in order to do transactions. So it's uh, two different models. So the fact that there is no embedded secure element um, is true on the Android side, but at the same time, you can't exploit it for uh, a large number of transactions. The risk is contained by limiting the number of transactions that you can do uh, using the Android. So I think there is a comparable level of security uh, in both models. That's terrific. Thanks, Sadiq. Okay, well, we are out of time today for questions. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Kathy, um, I want to thank again our panelists today for their terrific support and contributions to the discussion. If you have any additional questions, you can submit them to the email addresses on the screen to those individuals or to me, and we'll try to get you answers uh, via email. And uh, anyone who registered for this webinar will receive an email from us shortly with a link to the website where you'll be able to both listen to this re pre recorded webinar and also download the presentation. And we invite you to share that uh, link and the presentation and audio link with uh, uh, your colleagues. So thank you all for your time today. We hope to it was informative. And uh, please keep your eye out for uh, future events uh, led by the Smart Card Alliance.